Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, I am truly honored on behalf of the Adam Smith Center for Economic Freedom to have this conversation with President Leonel Fernandez of the Dominican Republic. Uh, we're going to have this as a conversation, but uh, any great speaker deserves a great introduction. So Professor Eduardo Gamarra will do the honor of introducing President Fernandez. Eduardo. Thank you very much. Um, welcome to, to all of you. Uh, we're uh, we're going to have a, a President Fernandez give us a, a, his vision of uh, something that interests our class very much, uh, Mr. President. I have with us a, a, a course called The Politics of Latin America. Most of the students here are, are undergraduate students, but uh, with a great interest in Latin America. So um, I've known uh, Dr. Fernandez for, uh, in fact, we were, we were reminiscing this afternoon about 40 years. And I guess that's saying a little bit about how, uh, about our age. But uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've known the president for many, many years. Uh, had the privilege of working with him on a number of different important projects. Uh, and a lot of them uh, in relationship to, to our university. Um, this is, I don't know the, how many times the president has been here. But usually when the president comes here, he, uh, uh, the first thing he does is he goes to, to the to the bookstore and everybody in the bookstore knows him because he generally buys half of the collection there <laughs> to take home. So um, the president served as president of the Dominican Republic from 1996 to 2000 and then from 2004 until 2012. Uh, he, uh, um, he also is the founder of uh, a very, very important think tank uh, called the, uh, the Global Foundation for Development and Democracy based in Santo Domingo, but which has offices uh, in several places, uh, uh, New York, for example, and now here in Miami. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Jose uh, uh, is, the, is the director, and uh, uh, so if you would stand up, and uh, we're, we're working on doing it again. We're developing some programs together uh, uh, as a, um, not only with uh, your center, but also through the Latin American Center and the Gordon Institute here at, at FIU. So, uh, so again, uh, uh, welcome <coughs> to all, and Mr. President, again, a privilege to have you here. So now I'll turn it over to you for your Thank, thank you, Arthur, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, the President has been in many interviews, many academic settings. I think I first met him over 25 years ago when he came to give a talk at Harvard as, as president, and he gave a wonderful you know, academic talk. Uh, and I want to do something a little bit differently. Uh, I want to have a conversation with him, not only as the former president of the Dominican Republic, but as Lionel. I want you to get to know the man uh, behind uh, the very important office that he held uh, for three different periods, and who knows, might hold again <laughs> at some point. Um, he's eligible for two more two terms, um, and so uh, I want you to get to know him. And so I will ask a few questions about the Dominican Republic and about Latin America, about the U.S., but I also want to begin asking you about, about you, about your time in public service, about how you became in, in, interested in being a public servant. Uh, you've been in politics for a long time, so tell us, uh, uh, why politics? Why public service? Well, thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Professor Eduardo Gamarra for your very kind introduction. Thanks uh, to all of you for being here today. Well, let me tell you a little bit about that. I never thought of being a politician. I wanted to be a baseball player. That's what I wanted to be. Uh, I Tough came, competition from the Dominican Republic. <laughs> <laughs> I came to New York when I was eight years old, so I was raised in New York, and I used to go to Shea Stadium, right, where the Mets, the Mets. played all the uh, National League baseball teams. And then we had a very uh, high-profile Dominican ball player, the first Dominican to get into the Hall of Fame. His name is Juan Marichal. Mm -hmm. And I used to go to, the, to Shea Stadium to mm -hmm. see Marichal pitching. Who lives in Miami now. Who lives in Miami now, that, that's right. And then I was really impressed. 45,000 fans at Shea Stadium, many of them waving the Dominican flag. So I associated sports with Dominican Republic while living in New York. So my first dream was becoming a baseball player. Uh, but I got into a deep slump. I was never able to get out of it, striking out all the time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a very uh, early stage, I made the right decision to move forward into some other field. 
interest perhaps in politics began at home in New York. My mother was a nurse uh, and also she worked as an operator uh, sewing machines uh, in one of the factories in New York. And on weekdays and Sundays or Saturdays, she will invite some of her friends that would come from other parts of New York, from Boston, where Dominicans used to live at the time. And they would speak about Dominican politics. And so I was nine, 10 years of age. I didn't pay much attention, but I know they were talking about Dominican politics. My mother was an avid reader. She would read, about, she would read Dominican newspapers, Dominican magazines, Dominican authors. So my family was always very much involved or interested in politics. But perhaps I would say the interest began when I returned to the Dominican Republic at the end of the 60s. Uh, because I went into a neighborhood that really had an impact on me. That neighborhood called Villa Juana uh, in the in capital city, Santo Domingo, most of the, of the youth of the time was highly interested in politics and culture. So just about every, every night, they would go uh, in the neighborhood outdoors and speak about different topics, basically about Dominican politics. So just coming from New York, more interested in, in, in baseball and, and sports in general, I began listening to them and I was attracted by the way they spoke and the things they spoke about. So they began uh, lending books and so I began reading some of these books uh, and became very much interested. I was beginning high school years. Most of these uh, youngsters were already in college. Uh, and so they had an influence, creating an interest about Dominican politics. Of course, there was a natural environment to be interested in politics in the Dominican Republic at the time. We have had a long dictatorship from 1930 to 1961, Trujillo dictatorship. And then after that, we had Juan Bosch, who was the first elected, democratically elected president after the dictatorship uh, came down. And uh, well, he was elected, he was overthrown by a military coup. In 1965, there was a uh, popular uprising in the Dominican Republic to bring back Juan Bosch uh, to power. But then it was the Cold War and many analysts mistakenly thought it was going to be a second Cuba, which was not. It was more a democratic uh, revolution that was taking place. And so there was a U.S. military intervention in the Dominican Republic in 1965. And so people were still talking about that, about that intervention and how we should regain our national sovereignty, our national identity as Dominicans. Uh, at this, you know, so there was a natural environment to speak about politics and become interested in politics and about culture, Dominican culture. I remember at the time, there is, I, I met the most important Dominican poet of the time, Pedro Mir. He would come to the neighborhood and speak and, and lecture. And so we were able to really get in touch with these kind of people that influence uh, my generation. So uh, the interest, I, was, I would say, becoming aware about the importance of politics in the Dominican Republic began in my neighborhood. Now, officially, I began participating when I entered the university in 1971. Univer Autonomous University of Santo Domingo, WAST in Spanish. Uh, and they had uh, student groups. But those student groups were more linked to political parties, not like here in the U.S. Uh, you have a student association, but it's more academic. And, and now it's more academic here, uh, what, what students do. And the DR at the time was more political. So I began participating in a movement called Frente Universitario Socialista Democrático FUST, a social democratic uh, student front. But it was linked to a party, the Dominican Revolutionary Party. So we began participating there. Juan Bosch returned to the Dominican Republic beginning the 70s, and he began speaking daily on radio, half an hour every day. He would speak like, not like a politician, but more as a professor. So I began listening to him, reading his books, and that's how I got more involved into politics mm -hmm. yeah, at the beginning. Yeah. You mentioned briefly baseball. Uh, what is it about the Dominican Republic that produces <laughs> so many great baseball players, more than any other uh, Latin American nation? Well, uh, really, it's, it's a miracle what we have had, no? The, the possibility of having Dominican ball players get into the major leagues in the 60s, they opened the door for the others. And now we have major league baseball academics operating mm -hmm. in the Dominican Republic, about 24 of them. So just about every major league baseball team has a, an academic in the Dominican Republic. And some of our youngsters are signed as young as 16 years of age. 17 years of age, where Sandy Alcantara oh, uh, won the uh, Cy Young Award last mm -hmm. year 
best pitcher in the National League. And so, yes, Dominican, we call it baseball lands. Dominican Republic is baseball lands, uh, really. Um, uh, what role do you think government needs to play, a government like the Dominican government, in promoting things like the arts, sports, areas where in the U.S., for example, the government is not really involved? Uh, well, in our case, government has to play a very active and dynamic role uh, because the private sector is not as developed as it is in a developed country, so government really takes care of that. In, in, in sports, related to sports, we have a sports ministry, mm -hmm. and my sports minister was Juan Marichal. So you see how things connect. I used to see him playing here uh, in, in, in the States, and then when I was able to get, a, when I was elected, then I, I appointed him as the first uh, uh, minister of sports because of his prestige mm -hmm. and because of his connections here in the U.S. And I would say uh, Dominican Republic is not only good in baseball, uh, we're good in volleyball, uh, we're very good in boxing, uh, we're very good in softball, in different, in, in, in martial arts. Yeah, in, Football. In football now. Exactly. Well, we're beginning. We're beginning. <laughs> we don't have a Pelé there yet, but uh, eventually. Not yet. And so we say that the Dominican Republic is not a, a world power. It is not a military power. It is not an economic powerhouse. But we are a sports powerhouse worldwide because we, we, get, we go to the Olympics. We get uh, gold medals and silver medals. So it's, it's a source of pride for mm -hmm. the Dominican Republic to be so good in, in different uh, sports. Another area where the Dominican Republic really has excelled is instability. For, for decades, uh, the Dominican Republic has been remarkably stable politically, but also economically. We have a lot of students studying Latin American politics, and, and, and they would know that we have some regimes in Latin America that are politically stable, but economically unstable. Others that are uh, um, uh, politically unstable, but economically fairly stable. I think Peru comes to mind. Others that are politically unstable and economically unstable. Right. But the Dominican Republic is a model of, of political stability and economic stability. Since you were president the first time, there have been presidents of other parties, uh, yet the, the, the macroeconomic stability has been remarkable. Right. Uh, you welcome foreign investments, uh, regardless of who's in charge. What is the secret to that Dominican stability, both political and economic? We have gone through stages. Right, right after Trujillo's death, uh, our main goal was freedom and democracy. Uh, we had the first experiment, as we said before, but it failed. Uh, the Bosch regime, the coup d'etat, uh, the military uprising, it failed. Uh, then we had Balaguer, Joaquin Balaguer, who has become a legend uh, in Dominican politics. He governed from 66 to 78. Into his 90s? Until his 90s and blind. Yeah, and blind. And blind. <laughs> so we had a, a blind president in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> but, uh, Brilliant man, brilliant man, great scholar, magnificent uh, public speaker, like no one else. He would quote on the Greeks and the Romans uh, out of the top of his head. So a very, very highly educated, cultivated man. As any politician, history will judge, finally. But uh, my belief is that it's more positive than negative, uh, what he did for the country. Those 12 years, there was economic growth. Uh, the economy was expanding, even though politically it was semi-authoritarian, I would, I would say that. So modern democracy in the Dominican Republic begins in 1978. We had uh, free and fair elections at the time. I think President Jimmy Carter, we spoke about this before, uh, influenced the uh, Dominican electoral outcome in 1978. When President Carter came to office, he promoted a policy of human rights and free and fair elections in Latin America, and I think that had uh, an impact uh, in our country, alongside with other elements, other factors that were taking place outside the region. Uh, remember that it was not only the Dominican Republic, but in the 60s and 70s, there were military coup d'etats everywhere, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Chile, everywhere. And politics was framed in terms of these are fascist governments, and we're struggling for a socialist and transition. Mm -hmm. So it was either capitalism or socialism at the time. But many of these uh, political leaders that were persecuted by the military regimes, they traveled over to Europe. Mm -hmm. Many stayed in, in Spain, others in Germany, others in Sweden, Sweden, Switzerland. And at the time, I think three major events took place that influenced the Latin American leadership and the, and the Dominican Republic political leadership as well. 
It was the death of the of Francisco Franco in Spain. This, was, this took place in 1876. And with the death of Francisco Franco, a democratic transition began to take place in Spain. Many Latin American leaders living in Spain at the time say, well, this makes sense. I think we can perhaps do the same thing in Latin America. Yeah. So instead of fascism versus socialism, it became dictatorship versus democracy. The other was uh, the fall of the military in Greece. Mm -hmm. And at the end also the fall of the, of the uh, family, the Salazar family in Portugal, Portugal, right? Another major element is when the socialist institution, uh, las, uh, uh, el socialismo internacional, international Inter socialism, socialism. Uh, in Europe was more Eurocentric, they opened the door. So Latin American, traditional Latin American political parties would participate within the international socialists. Mm -hmm. And then you had leaders like François Mitterrand in France, Billy Brandt in Germany. Um, and, and so they became interested in Latin American politics and they influenced. So it was Carter, human rights policy and free fair elections. It was the European process of ending dictatorships and, and, and pivoting into democracies. Latin American political leaders were there, they were influenced, they came back and then they had a new mindset about uh, where the uh, political struggle should uh, move into. So the Dominican Republic was the first location, the first country in Latin America that made that transition, right, in 1978. And from there on, we've had free fair elections for the last 40 plus years. So we have been able to understand, uh, and I think there is a consensus among all political parties in the Dominican Republic, there's a consensus that you need to have stable democratic political system in order to have economic growth and have social economic development. And we can see the difference between Dominican Republic and our neighbor, Haiti. The problem with Haiti is, it is that it doesn't have a democratic political stability system. It is undemocratic, it is unstable, and because of that, there's a lot of poverty, a lack of opportunities, and so we see that the uh, solving current problems in Haiti needs to go by first, stabilizing politically, creating democratic institutions. So if you have that, there will be confidence in investing in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, private, local investments, foreign direct investment in the country. And then we were also making a transition in terms of economic development. Dominican Republic, as just about every country in Latin America, were export-led countries. In our case, sugar, coffee, tobacco, etc. cetera. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, then there was a transformation mm -hmm. more into a service-oriented economy. So we began promoting tourism, mm -hmm. free trade zones, and free trade zones is manufacturing, but uh, more export-led. So in those, uh, in those corporations, you would manufacture uh, apparels, footwear, plastics, medical equipment, et cetera, and basically export it into the U.S. market on a duty-free basis. Mm -hmm. Originally, uh, in the 70s and 80s, there was a program called the Caribbean Basin Initiative, CBI. And with CBI, we would export uh, into the U.S. market textiles, apparel, and these other products I was speaking about. They would enter the U.S. market on a duty-free basis, unilaterally. So we didn't have to open our economy to import goods and services from the U.S. Now, in the 90s, at the end of the Cold War, the whole uh, program was uh, changed, and now it's, uh, it's bilateral. Mm -hmm. So we, we, now for, we are part of what is called DRCAFTA, Dominican Republic, Central American Free Trade Agreement, and because of that, we continue to export into the U.S. market, and now we also import from the U.S. market. Uh, many products also duty-free. So this is how it, how it plays out. So we have tourism and free trade zones and uh, growth within the financial sector, uh, commerce, and this has enabled the creation of a, an expanding middle class in the Dominican Republic. Another major factor is Dominicans abroad, especially here in the States. Mm -hmm. We have nearly two million Dominicans in the United States. We are 11 Dominicans back home, two million more abroad. And it's interesting because in the last census, what we see is that those two million, 1.1 million were born in the States and only now 900,000 migrated uh, to the United States. So what we see as a trend 
-hmm. is that looking into the future, we'll have more Dominican, well, many children born of Dominican parents living in the States. This has also made a great contribution to the country because they send remittances, they send financial resources to the families and to the ties back home. Last year was record, 10 billion US dollars were sent by Dominicans living here to Dominicans at home. So it's tourism, it's free trade zones, it is remittances and, and traveling mm -hmm. and all this has made a tremendous transformation into the Dominican Republic. You mentioned the military dictatorships for, for, for a couple of decades, you had a bunch of military dictatorships in Latin America. Then beginning in the 80s, we see that you know, democracy began to arrive in many of these areas that had uh, uh, dictatorships. And we saw a new wave of, of, of democracies emerge all over Latin America. And so there was a lot of promise for democracy. People believe that democracy was the solution to, to Latin America. Now what we're seeing is that there's a bunch of uh, regimes throughout Latin America that were elected initially democratically, uh, Cuba, the clear exception, but others that were initially democratically elected regimes that have gone the authoritarian route and that have tried to remain in power repeatedly, uh, whether you call them populist or different type of, of regime, uh, most of them on the left. Uh, uh, do you think democracy has lost its, its luster? Are, are we seeing a return? Maybe not to authoritarianism the old fashioned way through dictatorships, but uh, a new type of authoritarianism emerging in Latin America? In a way, yes, even though I think democracy still prevails in general terms, I would say those with uh, authoritarian inclinations are the exception. Just about the rest of the countries are more democratically centered. Uh, the rule of law, constitutionalism, I think that prevails still today. Now, the thing is, uh, who comes into power or the, uh, nowadays depends on global trends, global economic mm -hmm. trends, and the influence they're having in the electoral political cycle in Latin America. This is something relatively new. We, we've always known that there is a correlation between economics and politics. If the economy is doing well, and uh, the government tends to be reelected, mm -hmm. if there is a downfall in the economy, most likely the opposition will come into power. But that used to be on the local, local terms. Now it's globally. You know? Global economic trends define political electoral cycles in Latin America. So when did the, the, uh, the democratic left, I, I should call it, is not the armed left, it's not a revolution, they, they came elected by, by the people, no? This democratic left, or center left in Latin America, came into office due to the uh, recession that began to take place in 2001. That's what explains that Lula won the elections in 2002, and all the others, because there was uh, an economic situation that was having a negative impact there was uh, rising prices in food specifically, uh, unemployment, a lot of marginalized people in the urban areas. So that enabled democratic left parties to come into power. Now they were lucky enough that uh, once in office, China began growing at 12% average annually, something extraordinary. And uh, China began demanding uh, natural resources that we have in, in the region, uh, oil, uh, natural gas, uh, copper, soybeans, etc. So China was buying all of these products. And so for the first time, these governments, especially in South America, were having enough resources mm -hmm. that they can invest in social policies. So they were investing in more in education, investing more in healthcare. And so people were, I would say, supporting massively mm -hmm. these governments. They got reelected many times. They had an enormous popularity, right? And uh, it took a whole decade, from 2003 to 2013. And they call this the golden decade, economically in Latin America. But beginning in 2014, it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. So China began lowering its economic growth. There was less demand of commodities coming from Latin America. And from 2014 to 2019, the year before the pandemic, there was a downfall in Latin America's economy. It only grew 0.5. While in the previous decade, from 2003 to 2013, it grew 5.5 percent, then a downfall to 0.5 mm -hmm. percent. And so those governments that came into office or, or that were in office, they lost the upcoming elections. So in the last 14 elections that has taken place in Latin America, from 2014 to 2022, all governments have lost elections, with the exception of Nicaragua, mm -hmm. because the president jailed all his opponents. Mm -hmm. So every one of them. Every one of them, right? 
So it, he didn't win in a fair way. So this is this. So you think it's cyclical? It's cyclical. I think politics is like a pendulum. It's like a pendulum in mm -hmm. Latin America, more dependent nowadays of global economic trends. Mm -hmm. In our case, the Dominican Republic, we're, we're more connected to the U.S. Mm -hmm. We're more connected to the U.S. system. Uh, if the economy is doing well in the U.S., uh, then it has a positive impact in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. For example, what is taking place at this moment? Because of stimulus programs put in place here in the U.S. after the pandemic, uh, consumers are buying more here in the U.S. Uh, if you go to shopping malls, you see people buying all the time. Uh, if they buy shoes, if they buy clothing, most of this is manufactured in countries like the Dominican Republic. So employment has risen in the Dominican Republic due to U.S. Cons consumption, right? Mm -hmm. So this is helpful. But at the same time, there is inflation. Uh, and if the Federal Reserve increases rates, Dominican Republic has necessarily to increase rates the, at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if the central bank doesn't increase the rates, then there will be a capital, a capital flight mm -hmm. from the Dominican Republic trying to station where they will get more return. Mm -hmm. So it's all connected. 92 central banks around the world are doing the same thing, increasing, increasing rates, interest rates, right? So there is a connection there. Now, if you, if you raise interest rates to bring down inflation, most likely you're going to slow economic growth. And if you have to continue raising interest rates, at some point there will be a recession. And if there is a recession, whoever is in power will lose the next elections. Now, uh, of all the countries we talked about, uh, there's three that have remained authoritarian for a long time. One, Cuba, 64 years. Uh, Venezuela, a quarter of a century. And Nicaragua, whether you count the first in the 80s, the first period of Ortega, or the recent one, even more. Um, the Dominican Republic, again, has been a model of stability, democracy, free markets. Is there a role for the Dominican Republic to play in perhaps bringing these countries on the democratic side? Well, and if so, what should that be? I think we began playing that role uh, during my administration when there was a crisis between Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. Uh, Colombian troops entered Ecuadorian soil persecuting members of the, of the militia groups, members of the guerrilla groups. Uh, Colombian guerrilla groups supposedly operating from, from Ecuador. So we had a meeting by the, what, what is called then the summit of Rio de Janeiro in the Dominican Republic. And there was a quarrel between these three countries. Even they were going to uh, file a lawsuit in, 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 in The Hague, no? For violation of human rights and, and whatever. So we were able to solve that problem uh, in a diplomatic way. And so we left the meeting with the idea that the Dominican Republic could play a role of mediating uh, on conflicts within countries in the region. I remember the president from Honduras saying, Santo Domingo is the capital of peace in Latin America. And then some other conflicts came about and we were able to solve that. Especially Honduras, when there was a, a military coup against President Zelaya, I had to go and travel being president of the Dominican Republic to rescue Salaya, who was uh, in exile in the Brazilian embassy, but under threat that would be killed by the Honduran military. And so we were playing the role of mediating conflicts in the region. But successive governments have not you know, been up to the, uh, to the occasion. And I think we have abandoned the idea of being neutral in order to solve problems within the region that no one else could solve. Because there's, uh, in some cases, lack of trust on OAS organization of American states. They don't trust what takes place there. They say it is influenced by the U.S. and Canada. They want to have something more Latin American. Uh, and there is no uh, resource, there's no, uh, I would say, third party on which you can rely to solve these uh, conflicts that come about now and then among... Uh, and so going countries. forward, what do you think the Dominican Republic can do to bring democracy to these three countries in particular? Well, we can, we can only show our example uh, that Dominican Republic has progressed that we have modernized our country with uh, democratic political stability. And uh, that's the only way that can be done. And I think people are beginning to understand that. Because I would say this, Carlos, right from the declaration of independence of our countries at the beginning of the 19th century, the goal always was to establish democratic regimes. But we, we were never able to. The 19th century was always a struggle between caudillismos in different places. We never were able to, with some exceptions. Mm -hmm. Then entering the 20th century was the Mexican Revolution. 
I think, made a, an impact in terms of eliminating uh, dictatorship of the time, Porfirio Diaz, and having a democracy with its flaws, because mm -hmm. a one-party democracy for many years. Now, Mexico has different political parties. It's, it's a, a plural party political system. Well, you have Mexico, and then some of Chile, at some point, up to Allende, when then there was a coup, and then you had Pinochet for many years, and now Chile, once again, is within the democratic, right. uh, the democratic uh, circle. Uh, at some point, you have a democratic Christian president. Another time, you have a socialist president. Now we have a young, very young socialist president. But he has to operate within the framework and the limits of a democratic constitution. So it's important to have the rule of law. And everybody has to respect that mm -hmm. rule of law. Otherwise, Absolutely. he creates a condition to be ousted from government, mm -hmm. as recently has happened in Peru. Mm -hmm. When the president came out, he said he was going to dissolve the Congress. Mm -hmm. He couldn't step out of the door. Right. Uh, and, and I think uh, it was a, a, a self-inflicted coup that took place in that, in that location. So with Cuba, we have to perhaps understand the historical moment. Uh, Cuba really was never democratic. Cuba was the last country to achieve independence at the end of the 19th century, 1898. Mm -hmm. And Cubans felt that they were mediated by the U.S. That the, the U.S. played a very active intervening role in, in Cuba, and so Cubans never understood there was really a democracy there. Juan Bosch, my mentor, uh, lived in Cuba for over 25 years as an exile, and he was a consultant to President Carlos Prioso Carras, the only democratic president prior to the revolution in 1959. So the revolution in Cuba took place in a moment where there were many other dictatorships in the region. And there was no democratic path to overcome those regimes. So Fidel Castro led the revolution in Cuba in 1959. Some Dominicans participated in that revolution with Fidel Castro. The revolution in Cuba triumphed in January 1959. And we had an expedition, a military expedition, coming out of Cuba in June 1959, six months later, with people that were trained and participated in the guerrilla with Fidel Castro coming to the Dominican Republic to overthrow Trujillo, the 14th of June movement. Mm -hmm. So at the time uh, when the Cuban Revolution took place, the idea was there's no other way mm -hmm. because the democratic path has been obstructed. We have to do it by revolution. Uh, and so Fidel was seen as a hero uh, in Latin America at the time. When Juan Bosch was overthrown by a coup d'etat, and then there was a popular uprising in 1965, a U.S. military took over, people of my generation that began participating in politics, they thought that the only way out was going to be through a revolution. So the revolutionary phenomenon is something that must be understood in the context of the historical process at the time. Now, once you are able to get into power through the democratic system, revolution doesn't make sense. So revolution has become some, something obsolete. The revolution that's taking place nowadays in the 21st century is the revolution of knowledge, mm -hmm. science, and technology. And that's the only way that we can also move on, move forward mm -hmm. in Latin America through knowledge, through science, through technology transfer, so that we can increase our productivity, our competitiveness in uh, international trade, and create a volume of wealth that well distributed will make our countries, modern countries in Latin America and around the world. You mentioned China very briefly. Uh, some would argue that the United States for a long time has ignored Latin America and that uh, uh, by creating a vacuum, uh, uh, the Chinese have been able to step in and right now they are uh, South America's biggest investor, uh, biggest trading partner and uh, uh, the second for Latin America. We're not for Mexico. Uh, where U.S. trade is, is key, it would be the biggest in Latin America. Are you concerned about uh, the Chinese in Latin America, A, and B? If so, what should U.S. foreign policy look like uh, so that uh, uh, the U.S. has a bigger, stronger, more robust presence in the region? I think the U.S. was more concerned and involved in Latin America because of the Cuban Revolution. And then you have President Kennedy talk about the Alliance for Progress. It was a response to the Cuban Revolution. But then in the 1980s, as the uh, dictatorships gave way to democratic uh, governments, I think there was a neglect from the U.S. Uh, policymakers in terms of the importance Latin America had for foreign affairs, uh, for the U.S. foreign affairs. I think there, 
there was some sort of neglect in understanding the importance of Latin America. Now, the Chinese began coming into the region more the 90s and the beginning of this, of this century, especially in South America. And I, I would say this neglect or indifference came more from the economic side. U.S. multinationals began abandoning Latin America. They thought that Latin American countries were too small, not enough population to buy goods and, goods and services from, from the U.S. U.S. companies, on the other hand, began going to China, investing in China, right? Uh, the industrial belt up in Northeast, I, I know that because we have many Dominicans living, for example, in Providence mm -hmm. and Lawrence. This used to be manufacturing places, no? Ghost cities nowadays. Those companies went to China. And they went to China because they saw China had a huge population, 1.4 billion, so they're going to be consumers, they're going to buy uh, American products manufactured in China. Dominican Republic only has 11 million uh, people, uh, you know, it, not enough population to buy goods and services for America. So all these companies left, or the majority of these companies left. You don't find one U.S. company doing infrastructure development in Latin America. I don't know of, of, of anyone. And so uh, Chinese companies began, co began overtaking U.S. market in South America, not in the Caribbean. In the Caribbean, U.S. always had a tighter connection, and it's just been recently because Taiwan was unable to really deliver in terms of connecting the Latin American countries with investments coming from Taiwan. Taiwan was also investing in China. Taiwanese companies were going to China. So the, the, the Taiwanese government was interested in having a relationship with our government, but the Taiwanese private sector made no investments. They were still aiding. Yeah, we'll give you uh, ambulances or we'll build a hospital for you. Well, we have become middle class income countries. We don't need this type of aid anymore. We want investments. So the Taiwanese or the US companies were not investing. The Chinese come in, they say, we're going to build this for you, we're going to do the other thing, and so they become attractive. I think the U.S. has reacted, lately I would say, to the penetration of, US, of China in, in this part of the world, but still early enough, still. I think the U.S. has a geopolitical interest in, you know, in increasing its support in this part of the region because we all, we all see that the rivalry in the 21st century is between U.S. and China. And we are in, I would say, in the geopolitical sphere of U.S. interests. And so the U.S. cannot ignore this part of the world anymore because you can install uh, naval uh, bases. Uh, you can have terrorist groups operating, for example, in this part of the world. And I would say, for example, Haiti. I think the U.S. is not paying enough attention to Haiti. Haiti is very close to U.S. soil. You can have terrorist groups operating there. You can have all kinds of things that would, that would damage U.S. Uh, homeland interests. So it, it, you have to pay attention to these things. You know? It's not only that Dominican Republic cares because it's our closest neighbor and we might have a massive illegal migration coming into our country, but it's because Haitians are migrating also illegally into the U.S. They're being returned when they reach the Keys, but many things can happen. So for geopolitical interests, I think the U.S. has to pay more attention Mm -hmm. To this part of the world, we need more investments, and we know that there's a new program called Near, Near Shoring. And with Near Shoring, I think we're going to, we're going to surpass uh, the impact of the free trade zones. Mm -hmm. Because I think we can bring the global chain system. With the global chain system, for example, Dominican Republic is not in the automotive industry. But we can be part of the automotive industry. Whatever components can be manufactured and be part of the chain, we can go into the air, aerospace, yeah. whatever. We, we, can, we can leapfrog mm -hmm. into you know, different products and services with more value added, which is the challenge that we have for the future. So speaking of those challenges, uh, we mentioned before you've been president for three terms. Uh, you're eligible for two more terms. Yes. If you were to run again and win, what would a Fernandez IV administration look different from the previous three? Well, uh, there is continuity and change uh, as everything. No? Continuity in terms that we are going to continue consolidating democratic institutions in the Dominican Republic. That's one. The rule of law. So there can be no way back. Whoever governs in the future, you have to maintain a democratic That's system. Right. We can improve that. We can make it more participatory so that citizens not only uh, have a passive, uh, a passive participation, 
that can actively participate in policy making, designing uh, uh, different policies for education, for healthcare, for agriculture, industry, whatever. Uh, that can be done, uh, but I think uh, one basic thing is guaranteeing permanent, sustainable, democratic stability in the Dominican Republic. From the economic side, we have evolved, as I said before, from agricultural exports more uh, into a service economy. Mm -hmm. I think our next step would be to scale up into a high-tech uh, economy, uh, more technologically driven, so we can apply, we can implement technology to every sector, to agriculture, to industry, to the service sector, so we will have more productivity gains. But at the same time, how can we get into uh, the world economy, especially here in the United States, with more goods and services with value added? Mm -hmm. One major element where FIU will help us govern well for the Dominican Republic mm -hmm. is we're going to work on something called a strategic alliance between Florida and the Dominican Republic. We see that Dominican Republic should be the next Florida in the Caribbean. Have the, the modernization, have a university like, like FIU uh, in, in, in some of our provinces back in the Dominican Republic. And I know we can do that because the president of the Student Association is a Dominican. Christopher is here. So, and Christopher, who surprised me, I just met him when I came in. PhD student. Is a PhD student in computer science, what we need in the Dominican Republic to make a real change. So Christopher will be a role model for Dominicans in the Dominican Republic because we want to get into the computer science, in biotech, in nanotech, in the software development, anything that has to do with a high-tech ecosystem that will transform the Dominican Republic. So you're in charge of that, Christopher, right from <laughs> um, In a few minutes, we're gonna start getting ready for student questions, so start thinking of your questions. Couple of concluding questions. Uh, you've been a public servant for a long time. Uh, what's your biggest regret and your, the thing you're the most proud of as a public servant? Well, you know, there's always a learning curve. Uh, I remember when I came in, people were protesting in front of the palace because they wanted a decree that was delivered by my predecessor to be changed. And then I say, what is it that they want? They, they were expelled from the places they were living near, near uh, a river, and they want to get back to that place. I said, can we do that? I said, you can do it temporarily until we build new houses for them. In the meantime, they don't have to be homeless. I said, it sounds, it sounds like a good idea. But then instead of just uh, annulling the previous decree, and, and delivering a new one, I invited those people to come into the palace, uh, to the cabinet room. Uh, so they will feel that it was a new democratic government mm -hmm. that was with the people. And so, yes, we were able to uh, arrange them back again where they were until we finally built the homes they went into. But then when other groups saw that, that the new president wa was inviting people to come into the palace, uh, strikes and protests began taking place every day. <laughs> So I think it's, I, I was paying the price for being a rookie <laughs> president. <laughs> I regret that also, I would say, salaries were, were very low at the time uh, when I got into, salaries for public servants. So I began taking the pressure uh, to increase those salaries. <coughs> and I made the mistake to do it before the end of the budget, the, bu the fiscal year. Uh, and people said that was unfair, that that was governing for the elites and not for, for the people and so, I regret that, but it, it, it was a lack of knowledge. It was a lack mm -hmm. of experience. And so we were able to solve that. Your biggest accomplishment? The biggest accomplishment? If you have to choose one. Um, well, <laughs> I would say when I inaugurated the Cy Santo Domingo Cyber Park, because I saw that as the wave of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, that dream has not been fully uh, fulfilled, but I think with the Technological Institute of the Americas, and the cyber park is converting that into a technological corridor of the Americas mm -hmm. that we will do in our, in, our, in our partnership with the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. The metro. Oh, the metro, the metro. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for remembering <laughs> that, yes. Uh, when we built the metro system, is a subway system mm -hmm. in the Dominican Republic, nobody thought we could do it. Uh, they said this is something for developed countries, not for countries like the Dominican Republic. And we did it with Dominican engineers. They built the subway. When we inaugurated the, the subway, the, the metro, uh, it, it was a day of pride for the Dominican Republic. We saw the flags everywhere. <laughs> and even in New York, people in their apartments were hanging the Dominican flag 
and sense wow. of pride that we were able to build a, uh, a subway system in the country. Thank you for, for remembering that to me. At the center, we're developing a, a leadership program to study leadership uh, in collaboration with the College of Business, and we have a scholar of leadership here. Um, in your opinion, briefly, what makes a great leader? Thinking about the people. It's not about you, it's about the people. Mm -hmm. So if you have that always focus that you're working to improve the life of your fellow citizens, mm -hmm. and, and it's a great personal sacrifice, then you might become a good leader. You have to listen. You learn by listening. Uh, you have to understand uh, the particular things that really interest people. Uh, you have to be a people's man in order to become a leader. So we began talking about you as a public servant, and I want to conclude with a question. Uh, that I ask every leader that comes into the center. Uh, we have a lot of young students here, tons. And I'm sure many of them uh, uh, want to be public servants one day. But they, they, they read the news, uh, they look at what's going on around them, and all they see is, is the negativity surrounding uh, uh, public service. Politicians, the, the, the corruption, uh, the scandals. What do you tell them to become, uh, what, why should they be public servants? What words of advice would you give them uh, if, if, if they really want to be public servants, but they're turned off by what they read on, or see on television? Well, you know, I would say being a politician, especially in Latin America nowadays, is always serious business. And it's perhaps even dangerous because your reputation is always on the line. But there is also a sense of honor serving your country. Right? And if you get that honor bestowed upon you and you can really make a contribution and be able to transform uh, the country, I, I mean, there's no more honor than that you can get. On a personal level, uh, if you're someone who is seeking knowledge and experience, there's no other place that you can gain more knowledge than being a public servant. Because politics has to do with everything. If you become a medical doctor, you only know about medicine and you only know about your, your area of expertise. If you become a lawyer, you, you stick with civil law or you're a trial lawyer, but you don't know much more about that. But in politics, you know about everything. Mm -hmm. You know about healthcare, you learn about education, you learn about agriculture, you learn about, just about, so your, your interest for life opens up for you. It enlightens you to really, you understand the world better, you understand human nature better. So nothing is more transformative than becoming a public servant on the personal level. So if you're looking back and look at a young Lionel, the high school student, and you have a choice of being a baseball player, a Hall of Famer, or president, you would have cho I chosen would have the same. I prefer being a baseball player. I'm, I'm still stuck <laughs> to it. <laughs> I'm still stuck to it. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's open it up for questions. I'll ask if we can have the students uh, go first. So yes, right here. Yes. Say your name and where you're from. I'm Zolo Batista, born and raised in the Dominican Republic. I uh, moved here almost three years ago to pursue my bachelor's year in finance and economics. Um, Mr. President, a pleasure to have you. Um, basically, I just wanted to ask you, because I had the chance to be an intern in the Ministry of Finance uh, this last summer, and I will be heading to JP Morgan as soon as I graduate uh, to be in the investment banking division. And we're low-key heading into a recession, so I just wanted to know what measures and actions would you want to take if and when you get elected um, and you basically become president for the stability of the banking system, especially in the Latin America uh, industry. So for the next questions, we're going to have a microphone only for the benefit of people watching online. Uh. Right. Well, let me tell you, I, we have a very financial stable system in the Dominican Republic, as, as you well know. The last banking failures took place 2003, and ever since, uh, many measures were taken and implemented to have a, trusty, a, a trustworthy and uh, stable financial system. Now, you never know. Look, look what's happening here now. Uh, there a recent failure by two banks, and there's a lot of concern that it might spread and, and affect other banks here in the States or even in Europe. So we, we hope it doesn't happen because it's always a catastrophe when you have these financial fall downs. Uh, but I think with your experience, what you're doing here and what you're planning to do at JP Morgan will be of great interest for the Dominican Republic because we are connected to the financial international system. We're always issuing bonds. Uh, we're increasing our debt. And if we have Dominicans who are knowledgeable about how the global financial system operates, you can better represent the interests of the Dominican Republic. So I congratulate you. So we have in computer science and now in finance, I think the Dominican <laughs> Republic is heading for a very prosperous 21st century. Okay. 
Christopher? Yes. Okay, go here. The microphone right behind you. Hello, uh, my name is Ishmael, and I was born in the Dominican Republic. Uh, my major is political science, indeed. Uh, my question is, in 1995 and 1996, when you were working with President Balaguer and for President Bush, how did it come for you to be the candidate for the 1996 <laughs> uh, election? How that happened? And also, the next question will be, in 2018, when the Dominican Republic uh, withdrew the, rec uh, the recognition of Taiwan, the Republic of China, or the People's Republic of China, you were already an influential figure within the government. Uh, how did you react? What was your opinion on that decision? Okay. Great questions. Be before I answer the question, I would like to acknowledge the presence of two senators from the Dominican Republic that are with us at the audience. Dos senadores de República Dominicana. Diony Sanchez, who is the uh, speaker, and Franklin Rodriguez. They happen to be also members of our party, La Fuerza del Pueblo. <laughs> right? Uh, going to your question, uh, I, I've never held any public office. Uh, I was never a councilman or, nor a representative or senator as they are. Uh, I just came up to the ranks, no? In 1993, I was elected vice presidential candidate with Juan Bosch. And since, since he was already ailing a little bit, he was suffering from Alzheimer, he wasn't able to really campaign. So I, I campaigned for him uh, in places that he couldn't go anymore. And so I learned, listening to the people, I learned about what I said before, uh, the very peculiar things that interest people. So if I went, for example, to San Francisco de Macorís, that you know well, what is their interest? Rice production. So people would explain to me about rice, and I would learn a lot about rice production. If I go to uh, the border with Haiti, uh, Monte Cristi, people export uh, bananas. So they would explain to me what they would be expecting from a new government about banana exports. So you would learn about banana exports just listening to the people there. And that's how it happened. So we had a crisis. The only real crisis, no, we had one in 1992, an electoral crisis, again in 1994. And uh, the next period was lowered to two years. So instead of being from 1994 to 1998, it came 94, 96. And that's how I came in as a candidate in 1996. But it was because I was a vice presidential candidate the year before. Uh, my relationship was really with Juan Bosch. He was my professor, I would say. No? Um, in the Dominican Republic, one learns more informally than formally. Here you have the chance to come to a university and you learn the formal way. We learn by doing. Uh, we learn in practice. We learn in real life. And I would say being in politics taught me a lot. For example, I became a journalist, but because the party, our political party, had a, a newspaper. And I would write every week. I would write about economics. I would write about uh, international affairs. But it was never scholarly. It was something that was done you know, uh, every week, reading, of course, magazines, newspapers, books, whatever, and having coaching you someone who was a professional writer. So he would take his red pen and say, you don't write like this. You have to be more specific. Don't use adjectives. You always go directly to what you, know, you want to, to say. So you learn, you, you're trained in practice, and then you, you see the effect your writing has on people. You say, oh, I read your article. I find it very interesting. I learned a lot from what you said. That, that's the way we learn. That's the way it, it, was, it was happening. Uh, so with Balaguer, I didn't have that real personal connection, even though because he supported our candidacy, I did become acquainted with him. And my impression of him, as I said before, even though he has a long history, that came within the Trujillo regime, and my generation objected him because of that. They always thought, why a man of such brilliance and of such personal qualities was not in exile against Trujillo and stayed in the country supporting a dictatorship? Uh, but I think he has been a positive force. At the end, I think history will judge him as a positive force for change in the Dominican Republic. So uh, th that's the way it happened. I never thought I would be a presidential candidate. I never aspired to that. I was participating in politics because I could not be indifferent 
with what was taking place in the country. But by participating, you know, you become noticeable. Uh, people start looking at your leadership. You get involved, and, and that's what happens. I have a friend here, Joaquin Jeronimo, who was uh, my classmate back from ninth, ninth grade. And he also began participating with politics with me personally. He became ambassador. He uh, was ambassador during my period, my, my government. Uh, and, and now we are in this new political party for Southern mm -hmm. right? And Taiwan? Uh, Taiwan. Uh, repeat the question again on Taiwan. Of course. Uh, in 2018, the uh, government, you were already, uh, you were not president, but you were influential. You were an influential figure in, in politics and government. Uh, how was your reaction with the change of recognition from Taiwan to the to people China. of China? Look, uh, I think it was inevitable that that would happen because China has control. And then when Dominican Republic wanted, for example, to lead one of the agencies, we didn't have China support. But China was, was and is very influential in Africa. So all those African votes, we will not have it. Uh, China is, is very influential with countries in Asia. So Dominican Republic was alienated uh, in the UN system. We couldn't really hold any position because China will alienate the votes for any country that did not have formal diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. So Taiwan's influence was waning and, and, and China's influence was, was continuously moving up. Uh, so it was inevitable that at some point we needed to have formal diplomatic relations with the second most important and powerful country in the world. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can start it. I, I could project. Yeah, start it. Project. Uh, first of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for coming out here and taking time out. Your very busy schedule to meet with us, all Florida International University students. We thank you so much. So as you can see, there's a number of um, Dominican students studying here in the United States. So. Um, what measures do you think could be implemented to support and encourage um, those Dominican students studying here in the USA? Um, and how can Dominican Republic further benefit from the education and the skills these students bring back home? Right. Well, first of all, I think you're all very privileged uh, to be here in the States at the college level because you become bilingual, you become bicultural, you create a network of relationships that is, I would say, human capital, social capital, that would be of great interest for the Dominican Republic. Now, our main challenge is how can we bring you back? Because once you are at FIU, we have nothing of this nature back in the Dominican Republic. So how can we attract you? We have to create opportunities. And by that I mean, for example, in your case, the technological corridor, the America's technological corridor. If you find high-tech corporations in the DR, computer science, you will be willing to come back. Now, you won't stay because you will never stay definitely. You will be going back and forth. If you've lived here, you don't go back and stay there. There's so many things taking place here in the States that you need to come back now and then, right? So you become circular. You're there, you're here, you're everywhere. You become global. And we need global citizens in the Dominican Republic. If you go to JP Morgan, you know what that means for the Dominican Republic? the value added that you're having for your country? Fantastic, excellent. You cannot stay forever here. We need you down there, but you're not gonna stay there either. You're gonna be around here and there, but making connections, attracting uh, investors to the Dominican Republic, making the, of the Dominican Republic a showcase for the world. And that's what you can do. And that's what we are aspiring to create that atmosphere for our youth to be part of the transformative process in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, time for two more questions. We'll do, well, we got three hands, so let's do, yikes. Okay, we'll do one and two. Let's see. Go ahead. Then we have to leave. Um, here's a plane to catch. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so make it brief. Uh, uh, and name and where you're from. Good afternoon. My name is Lisey. I graduated from civil engineering last December, and I'm from the Dominican Republic as well. Civil engineering, okay. <laughs> <laughs> What do you recommend us as a new generation to keep um, making improvements and to help and serve our country? Not necessarily as politicians, but as global citizens. Right. Great question. Well, uh, I think for you, civil engineer here in the States, 
Dominican Republic is booming in, term, in terms of real estate. As a matter of fact, we have an engineer here. His name is Jose Spinal. Jose Spinal is a new generation of engineers in the Dominican Republic from Santiago, the second largest city in the country. And he's part of a movement that is transforming Santiago with new architectural styles. It's uh, glass and steel. You go into Santiago, you see it's a modern city. Little Miami is Santiago <laughs> because of what they're doing, right? So in your case, I would say stay in touch with you know, colleagues from the Dominican Republic, civil engineers, what they're doing down there. He would like to also bring his colleagues here and invest in Miami, invest in Florida, in real estate. Because if we're talking about integrating Dominican Republic into Florida, integration means many things. It means investments, it means trade, it means finance, it means science, it means education. So if we can bring investors from the DR to invest in Florida, they will accumulate a, a larger volume of wealth, but at the same time, they will learn with the new techniques that are being implemented here. And they will take that back to the Dominican Republic, and we create a bridge between Florida and the Dominican Republic for mutual benefit. It will benefit people living in Florida, it will benefit people living in the Dominican Republic. This is what I think is the wave of the future, building that bridge that can connect us together in the different endeavors in which we're involved, right? In your particular case, young Dominican, professional, living here, you have to read Dominican history. You have to somehow strengthen your national identity. You're global, but you're Dominican. Right? Your Dominican roots have to be strengthened and deepened every time, and that means getting emotionally connected with what takes place in the Dominican Republic. All right, go for it. Uh, good afternoon, Senor Presidente. My name is Sam Picardo, and I study international relations here at FIU. My family is originally from Venezuela. Well. Um, on the topic of building bridges, my question is Is the Dominican Republic making the same calculation that they don't want to uh, be stuck in sort of the competition between economically and politically between the Ch China and the US and want to keep fostering those regional relationships between, for example, Mercosur and the Dominican Republic? or the Dominican Republic in the EU, uh, especially in light of, for example, Mercosur is about to, or they already signed a trade agreement with the EU, which they've been working on for, I think, decades now. So do you see yourself fostering those more regional relationships and alternative bridges? Well, you know, you have to have a, uh, I would say, strategy for your country. And any country would try to diversify its international relations. So you'll have a presence everywhere, you know, in Europe, in Latin America, in the U.S., in Asia, everywhere. Now, our main partner is the U.S. For, for logical reasons. First of all, we have two million Dominicans living here already. Look at you. You're Dominican-Americans, right? You, you're, you have American culture. You have, Amer you have the English language. You have, so you are. Naturally, it comes out naturally because of demographics. Dominicans living in the States, 300,000 already in Florida. 300,000 Dominicans in Florida already. Uh, I mean, if, if, if you don't take care enough, there will be a legal massive overtaken by the Dominican Republic here in Florida, right? <laughs> Peaceful overtake. But what I mean is, you have to diversify. You need to have diplomatic relations with just about anyone in the world. You don't need to have 194 embassies around the world because you know, you a country like ours doesn't need to have an embassy uh, in Nigeria because we hardly have anything in Nigeria. But we do have an embassy, for example, in South Africa. We have an embassy in, in Morocco, uh, in, in the northern part of Africa. Of course, an embassy in Spain, in France, in the UK, all these countries, we have an embassy. We diversify, but our main partner is the US for demographics and for geographical proximity. We're one hour, 45 minutes away from Florida. We're right there. You can see Dominican presence at the Marlins ballpark on Saturday. It was Dominican Republic there. Dominican flag was there. I mean, this is, we feel in Florida like, like it's an extension of the Dominican Republic. So diversify, but you, you have partners. Huh? U.S. is our main partner. Haiti is our main challenge. One island, two countries. One has progressed. The other is in decline. 
So it's also very important for our international relations. So Florida has the third largest Dominican community. The third. In the United States. It's New York, New Jersey, and Florida. Yeah. All right, we have time for one concluding question. Uh, one of the you two, you choose. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm an electrical engineering student here at FIU. I'm Dominican. I was born here, but I grew up a lot in DR. And so a question that I often think about is power issues in the Dominican Republic, you know? Like when I'm in La Capital or when I'm in San Francisco, because I'm from El Nostro, there's never really stable power, you know? Is that something that the government can take care of? Is that something that the government tries to take care of? Is it something that can be taken care of? And as an electrical engineer, is there something that I can do maybe in the future? Right. Excellent. So a Dominican electrical engineering, <laughs> cero apagones. <laughs> Campaign slogan, huh? <laughs> Campaign slogan, cero apagones. <laughs> we have to deliver that. There we go. <laughs> yes, uh, I would say this. We have made a lot of improvements in terms of uh, electric power in the Dominican Republic, even though some people do not appreciate it because we still have blackouts. But we have increased our generating power enormously. Uh, transmission lines. Our problem has to do with distribution. And distribution creates more a social problem. We have many people that are incapable of paying the bills. When you're out of the capital city or the urban areas, people live in the countryside, they don't have the means to pay the electric bills. And so that creates an economic problem uh, for the country. So we say we have financial blackouts, more than electrical blackouts nowadays. We're moving more into renewables, more solar, more uh, wind uh, and more hydraulic uh, in order to lower the price of, of, of electric generation and create uh, a, a situation where there will be no more blackouts in the DR. But also blackouts occur because the economy is growing, new buildings are being constructed, there's new demand, and so our, our capacity to generate goes behind the need for new, for new demand, satisfy the new demand. So if the country is modernizing, the country is improving, moving forward, you need to generate more electricity than we had before. And uh, that, that generates the need for higher and bigger investments. And, uh, but the uh, technical electrical knowledge will be, will be tremendously of great importance uh, in the DR, so we expect you also to be there. <laughs> right? Congratulations uh, for uh, your, your degree in, in, uh, in engineering electricity, right? And in his case, born in the U.S. of Dominican parents. And now we have more Dominicans that were born here than those that came by migration. So you, you're a case uh, that can prove, prove the point. Mr. President, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a tremendous treat. We could be here a few more hours, but you have a plane to catch. I have a plane You've been very catch. generous with your time. Thank you all for coming, and thank you again thank uh, you. for being here with us. It's thank been a pleasure. Presidente, gracias.